Hi everybody, I'm happy to see the room full again. <coughs> Thanks for that. So it's our last talk and it will be given by um, Helio. He's from Brazil but he, he lives in the uh, in US. He works for now for a non-profit organization providing free literacy to students. And he will uh, talk to you about how you can do home monitoring with Raspberry Pi and Ruby. So please welcome him with me. All right, hello everybody. So um, let me get started and um, a little bit about myself. My name is Helio and I'm working in a nonprofit organization called Common Lead. We do free literacy tools and uh, student tracking tools, um, mostly students and teachers, uh, empowering teachers to improve education for kids. I've been doing software development for about 16 years and I've been working with Ruby on Rails for about seven years, roughly. Uh, so the agenda of my talk is going to follow these kind of kind of follow these major uh, steps, which is why Raspberry Pi, Parallela, or micro PCs. What is available for you guys to poke around, buy, install, set up your development environment, and uh, a motion sensor app that I used to monitor my house when I was on vacation. So uh, before I start, uh, uh, let me just ask you a quick question here. That I think there is three main topics in my talk. One of them is Ruby, the other one is Raspberry Pi, and parallel, and the other one is Ghost Stories. So who is here, who, who, is, who is in this room is like a Ruby and Rails developer? Can you raise your hand? Who is Raspberry Pi's kind of like stuff? And how about Ghost Stories? All right, cool. Uh, so let me get started. So. Why Raspberry Pi and Parallela? So there's not a lot of thing here in this slide that's kind of serious, but um, I was curious, I was not bored, and I was indeed doing some renovations at my house. Uh, and pretty much all these restarted uh, because of Ray Hightower. I, I saw one of his lightning talk in a conference a couple of years ago, talking about Parallela. And I was like, oh yeah, there is Parallela now, and there is Raspberry Pi, I've heard about these things. So one day I'm gonna poke around that. So. That's, that's how these, these next chapters of my career started. So what is available? Um, let's talk Raspberry Pi. You have Pi Zero, Pi One Model A, Pi Two Model B, Pi Three Model B. These are the ones available now. Um, and um, a little bit of a visual for you guys. Pi Zero, Pi One, all of them. Uh, they pretty much look like the same, uh, difference in size. To get a little, bit of, a little bit of perspective, this is a Pi Zero, and that's a quarter. So a Pi Zero is probably the size of your thumb. It's like, it's like this. Uh, and a Pi 3, a Raspberry Pi 3 case is like this. So that's is this case over here. So this is pretty much the size. The Pi 3, which is the one that I bought and I've been using it, is the size of, of a credit card. And this is that, that case. It's a uh, plastic case for a Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, a little bit of the differences between them. Uh, so you see, mostly what's matter to me is CPU and RAM. Uh, so you can see Pi Zero is a single core gigabyte, Pi A, Pi Pi One A plus, um, Pi Two and Pi Three they're quad core processors already, and the Pi Three B, which is the latest one that was released um, maybe a year or so ago, is like 1.2. Quite core. This is the one that I've been poking around. And this was also the first one to have uh, wireless and Bluetooth. Um, there is one interesting thing about this Pi 1A Plus, which is that is the low power. It's like one watt and half a watt. And usually they recommend this if you want to, uh, one of the scenarios that they describe that this is useful for is for if you have a balloon or something that's gonna fly around and it's gonna collect some data and you really need low power because it's up in the air, it's not in your, in your desk, uh, that's the one for it. Um, but um, it, it doesn't have Ethernet, so it is for embedded stuff, not for you to poke around in your basement. Um, as far as price goes, the Pi Zero is $5, freaking cheap. The Pi 3 goes to $40. Uh, a little bit of, about dimensions of them and some GPIOs. Uh, all the latest ones, they have 40 G GPIOs, uh, pins, for you to plug sensors in whatever you want. Uh, 
so now moving on to Parallela. Parallela is a pretty much another Raspberry Pi uh, board. And they have these three options, a micro server, a desktop, and an embedded. Uh, although they are pretty much the same, close to the same size, they are quite different in price and in power. All the Parallelas, they have 18 cores. Um, and they start, they, the starting price is $99, and the embedded one is to $260. So they all comes with one gigabyte of RAM. Uh, the desktop and embedded has HDMI, the micro server doesn't, and uh, they have only one USB port. So you need to plug something else if you want to poke around with that, mouse, keyboard, and all that kind of stuff. And the desktop has 24 ports, and the embedded 48. I haven't bought one of those yet, uh, but it's on my to-do list as soon as I, I, I finish all the stuff that I want to do with the Raspberry Pis. I'm kind of curious to see what these 18 cores is really going to do and compare with the Raspberry Pi for whatever basic simple application that I usually, that I want to do in, in, to do my home monitoring. Apart from parallel and Raspberry Pi, there are other things. Uh, so Intel, Asus, all these big PC uh, uh, companies, they have the, their own version. So this is Intel Galileo. Intel Galileo seems to run Linux, uh, but the, the Asus, no, it doesn't. And that one over here, this one, it does not come with a processor. You have to buy separately. And there is also these stick PCs. Uh, not sure if, has, have, has anybody in here ever used one of these? Okay, two people, all right, three. All right, um, so this is mostly Windows based and the way, this is an Intel one and this is an Asus one and the way this stuff is, you plug on the back of your monitor and then you have a Windows and that's it. Um, so, buy, install and set up. So now, now let's start getting into, uh, into the Pi stuff. Where to buy? Element 14, other fruit, Amazon or anywhere you find these, these micro centers near you. So I bought all, all, all of mine from Amazon. Um, and now what you should buy? That's a good question because it depends on what you're gonna do. If you like balloons and you wanna put your, your Pi in a balloon, you have to go to Pi 1 because that's the low power and that's the one that you need. Uh, if you're not, if you're gonna do this stuff in your basement, in your house, then you probably should go with the Pi 3, which is the latest one, has Wi-Fi and Ethernet. That's the one I started. And it's easy for you to find these starter kits, which comes with a Pi 3, a Pi, a case, a power supply, a heat sink, and you're gonna need to buy this stuff separate, these SD uh, cards. Uh, that's the basics. With that, you can have a Linux running on your, machine, on your home and, and poke around with that. Uh, you plug on a monitor and a, on a, the TV and that's it. You don't need much more than that. Extras on these is <coughs> camera sensors and a seven screen, seven inch touch screen display. Uh, on my first, with my starter kit, I also bought some sensors because I want to do a home monitoring and a motion presence app. So I bought that at the beginning. And then later on, I did buy the camera and the seven inch display seven inch at the screen, which is this one. This is the seven inch with a case and the Raspberry Pi is here at the back. Um, there is a board and this is the Raspberry Pi board over here. Um, so let's keep going. Install and set up. Uh, so depending on what machine you use at home, Windows, Linux, and Mac, uh, these are some references. Uh, if you do use Linux as your main laptop at home or at work, I suggest you go for the second reference, which is from Ubuntu Mate. That's just going to fuse at home to you. Uh, the other one is more perhaps for Windows and Mac users. Uh, and um, now I kind of, uh, I am at a third of my talk and I want to kind of breathe here a little bit and I want you guys to look at this slide. Uh, if there is one thing that I want you guys to remember is what is written on this slide. Uh, so if you ever start, uh, start working with Raspberry Pi for the first time because you came here and listened to me, this is what you, I, I, I want you guys to remember. So my tip to you, as soon as you start installing OSs in, I mean, I'm talking about Linux, not talking about Windows, but as soon as you start in, you start in, uh, installing uh, a, a Linux OS, uh, that's where you, you end up 
execute a couple of commands that will have some of these ones. And one of them is bs equals to 32m, and the other one is bs equals to 1m. And I hope that you remember me about these, and you, for the first time you use bs equals to 1m. Because if you use the other one and you happen to follow the steps I followed, you're gonna miss a lot of hours of your life troubleshooting something without finding a solution. And, uh, and I think it's related to that BS32M, which is kind of <coughs> block size 32 megabytes versus block size one megabyte. So I spend, um, I bought this stuff as a like, cool toy, comes at home, you're gonna, the, the family go to sleep and you go to your office to do some work and to poke around with a new toy and um, you spend five hours in there trying to install a freaking Linux on it and it doesn't work. And, uh, and then you go to sleep really sad because your new toy doesn't work. So that's kind of what happened with me from 10 a.m. to 3 a.m. in the morning, something like that. Uh, download. So these are the three main OSs that I would like to try and um, that I picked at the beginning. So Core is just a plain Linux core. There is no uh, graphical interface. Ubuntu made another one that has a nice, um, a nice, um, set of uh, installation steps, uh, pretty cool. Uh, and, uh, and there is these things, Windows 10 for IoT core, I was like, what? And they're like, okay, I may, I may decide to try. So when I, when I started, I bought only one of these, the SD cards, and then I bought two more. And this is uh, Ubuntu Mate, this is Ubuntu Core, and this is what I've been trying to do with Windows. So it's still my to-do list. So, and uh, the SD is still in the package. So, if you are a Mac user, and you're gonna install one of these Linux machines in your SD card, you mostly are gonna run these three commands, a DD list, and in, in, in those uh, references you have uh, more step-by-step -step on how to execute in these and what to do. Uh, and I have one slide at the end with all the references and I'm gonna publish these uh, after the talk and you guys can uh, look around. But basically you're gonna run these three, DD list to find, you, you're gonna, I mean, let me, let me go from the beginning. So you're gonna download an image, you're gonna unarchive it and you're gonna stick a SD card in your Mac. And then as soon as that is done, you're gonna run your DD list, which is just gonna find what is your SD drive. You're gonna do a disk U2 to unmount my disk two and then you're gonna do this DD which kind of, um, which kind of install that Linux uh, distribution on your uh, SD. And the third one is the one that's gonna take a little longer, uh, maybe 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and, um, and then as soon as you have your SD card all done with your um, Linux on it, and you're gonna put on the, on the, on the Raspberry Pi, plug in the, in the power, put on a monitor and a, or a TV or anything like that, and, um, and you're gonna boot. So the first boot will take a little longer, um, and you're gonna be sweating because you want this to work. And sometimes, I, depending on the Ubuntu that you decide, it automatically gonna extend the file system. If you use Ubuntu Mate, you have to manually do that, but there is a simple command in there in the, in the uh, installation procedures that you just need to run, and it's easy and fast. <coughs> you may need to do something else, so just follow instructions on the display. You may need to configure a network and create an admin, uh, an admin account, the first one that you have. And this is a little picture of my Raspberry Pi, my TV, and a keyboard. So if you look over here, this small, this small display here is exactly this box which is the seven inch, um, the seven inch display with the, with the Pi at the back. And that's my living room TV and a keyboard and mouse that I was using. Um, that's what I use for all the stuff that I did for the testing, I plug on my TV because I don't have a, a HDMI monitor and I have the TV, so. Uh, and this is uh, the Raspberry Pi, this is exactly this box and what you see over here is, this is a motion sensor, infrared motion sensor with a black tape on the kind of covering it to, to minimize the noise and so I, I could test. So this is actually what I ended up installing in my house and that I did my experiment. So, uh, 
<coughs> and um, as soon as you get, um, so you can use uh, your TV, TV monitor keyboard to use your, your uh, Raspberry Pi. You can use a seven touch, uh, seven inch touch screen, or you can just SSH to your, to your Linux machine for whatever laptop you have. So as soon as you do that, then you have your Linux in there. The Raspberry, the Raspberry Pi is done. Um, the installation is done. Now it's just another Linux machine that you are poking around. Uh, so now, as soon as, now that you have that Linux machine there, Let's uh, do some development, right? So uh, my main development environment is playing old Ruby style, RVM, RVMV, Postgres, PG Admin, and text editor, a browser, and I hook these up on my TV and, and then I have it. Uh, and um, I kind of toggle between using the TV and the keyboard and just SSH from my Mac to there, to the, to the Pi and then do some stuff in there. Uh, using Veeam, but uh, but it, you can do whatever if it's better for you. Um, it's a plain Ruby on Rails development environment, uh, as it gets, as, as, as classic as it gets. Uh, so this is the seven inch touch screen. Uh, there is a reference in there. It costs twice, close to three times more than the Pi itself. So. But if you plan to do some infotainment system or do anything that requires some kind of display for someone else other than you do, so you may need that. Uh, it does not look well, it does not play well if you wanna poke around the Linux itself because the screen is too small for you to, to open a terminal, to type a bunch of uh, terminal commands. Um, but but it, um, it, can be used, uh, it can be used as well. Uh, and this is um, an image that is started. Um, I just pull it up, that way you see my login page, my login screen. This is <coughs> a terminal screen, my, my keyboard and a mouse somewhere in there. This, this seven inch screen also have a soft, a soft keyboard. That's what you see in there in the bottom. Um, and then you can type it in there, but um, it, it's small. You're not gonna be able to type. You're gonna need to need some, some pins to do like you do on a tablet. You're not gonna be able to use that to type anything software development related. Um, I, I, I wasn't able. Um, so now let's move forward. Let's go to our motion sensor app. That's what um, I was wanting to do from the first place. Um, so that is my hello world for Raspberry Pi. That's the one that I decided to do. And basically what I want about from this motion sensor app, it's pretty simple. Detect a movement, and as soon as you detect a movement, you do something which is, and then if you go into the Ruby on Rails, Ruby uh, world is calling an API, it's pretty simple, sound an alarm, then you go back to the Pi and maybe you're gonna use um, uh, an external buzzer uh, to do that, turn on the lights and play the music, again you go back to the Pi uh, and, 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 and interface out, uh, turn on the camera, record something, and, um, and make, make a video from, from what, are, what are your surroundings are and, and stop when there is no more presence. And then you report an event in a video. So those are the kind of stuff that you can do. Um, the idea of, um, there is a very simple code to do <coughs> this scenario over here. Turn on, detect presence, turn on the cam camera, record, and then turn off the camera. <laughs> Uh, on the Raspberry Pi website, I can probably try to find that, that link uh, and put in the references. It's 20 lines of code and you can do that um, in Ruby and Python. Um, and uh, my motion sensor app started very, very simple because I don't wanna build a motion sensor app. I wanna build, I wanna monitor the sensor, but if you look at the data model, just users has location, sensors, events, and data. If you wanna, Locations and sensors can be kind of uh, uh, bundled together, but if you want to have separate uh, my living room or one house A, house B, and house C, your user can do that. And then each house has a bunch of sensors, and each sensor has the events, and each event has data, which is the video or whatever else data you capture, sound or anything. And um, I wanted to build this basic app because I want to detect uh, presence at my house and I want to be able to see that from my cell phone or from outside my house. 
And I use one of these uh, admin apps on Rails to build this very simple app that just create a sensor and um, allow me to log in and deploy that to Heroku. And that's what it looks like. Uh, that's, how, that's how I was monitoring my house. Um, and that you do in an hour or something, a couple, maybe a little bit more, you, you build that, that, that simple app for you to, to collect and store the data that's, that's been generated by your sensors in a, by, uh, uh, by monitoring whatever environment you are. Uh, and now comes back now to this uh, infrared motion sensor. This is the one that I used. Um, here's, these are the one that I tested, that I left in there. I, I kept the black tape in there um, just to, to minimize the area and try to get less noise. Uh, but basically, these, these are all the same. This is another one that I bought. Um, and this is a zoom version of that. Um, it's just infrared, in, infrared motion sensor. And basically, uh, there is a nice reference here. If you're curious about infrared motion sensor, I strongly suggest you to read this PDF. It's pretty cool, and that's where I got this picture. <coughs> and basically, the infrared sensor uh, has two areas, the red and the green, which is the hot and the cold. So when the heat comes through the, uh, through the, hat, to the hot area, the, pi, the sensor is going to generate a high voltage. As soon as you leave that and you go to the code and you leave the area, the, the, the sensor generates a low voltage. Uh, that's pretty much roughly from what I understood, that's how this sensor works. Uh, but in that PDF, there's a lot, of, a lot more information about this. And, uh, uh, but that's what I, I thought uh, I was uh, smart enough to share with you guys. Uh, and then now, uh, monitoring a, a, a sensor. So this is a little bit of code. I use this gem called Pi Piper. Um, and the reference is there, it's on GitHub, it's open source, and all of that. And this is a, a pretty simple uh, Ruby code that actually does my monitoring. Um, because the one thing that I wanted most is to get this stuff work in my house. Uh, so <coughs> you run these on, on your, that's what's going to be running on your Raspberry Pi. And basically what it does here is I have my PIN14. My PIN14 is, uh, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to show this, but it's a G GPIO PIN where you just put some jumper cables and um, uh, these cables here, these connect to the, to the sensor and the other side goes directly into your Pi. So in um, that uh, PIN14, that's where uh, the motion sensor is connected. That's where the data is. The other two cables of the motion sensor, one is power, grounded, and data. Uh, the data goes in the 14, and then you say, hey, as soon as 14 goes high, throw me an event, and then I'm gonna do something. That means that I detect, the sensor detects that presence. And, uh, uh, and then basically I do a little bit of logic in here, say, oh, all right, I don't wanna generate every single little thing going on through my living room, uh, so if, if the, 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 the burglar or if my wife or whatever else goes to my living room within the same, six, the same minute, I'm gonna consider that as a single presence. I don't wanna have five, five uh, motion events within a minute for the same person walking around. And that's the logic that I do on current presence and last presence and this simple math in here uh, to do that. And as soon as I do that, then I'm reporting. I'm gonna call my, that API, that, that, the Rails app that I have that has that CRUD app and also a very basic um, API, uh, API and it does not use any common practice of API because this is a post and not a get, but 3 a.m. in the morning I, I did a get to report that sensor and uh, Everything is hard coded in here. As soon as I started doing this for real, I hard coded the Heroku app in here. Uh, on the Heroku app, the sensor ID is one, so uh, this script is only going to work for that scenario because um, I didn't have much time and um, I was just experimenting, playing with it. So, uh, <clears throat> and that's how you monitor an um, infrared sensor. And one interesting thing here now is I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I think it's really unfortunate, let me make a, a side note here. I think it's really unfortunate that now we live in a world that I cannot travel with, those, uh, with all these electronics. I, I, I was encouraged enough to board an airplane coming from the US to, to, to Europe, bringing all these electronics. The maximum that I bought was these. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna, but, but there is one interesting aspect to all these sensors. 
every single sensor, regarding whether it's an infrared sensor or whatever other sensor, if they work in a high low, then your code is pretty much the same. Uh, and what you have to know, what the, the, the binding between these data being changed in the field in Raspberry Pi and whatever your cloud system you have is which sensor goes in which pin. Um, um, and, um, and there is a lot of software that you can build to make sure that your Pi is slave and you pull the data from the cloud but to do that, but there is nothing like that on, on this demo that I have. So let me show you a little bit of uh, sensor. Let me take you on a sensor journey and um, show you some of them. So that's the classic one that I showed you guys, the motion sensor. Um, this is smoke and combustible gas. I think they actually sent this wrong to me because they seem to be exactly the same. And <coughs> but they came as two different uh, sensors. In uh, this one, uh, guess, guess which one this is? Uh, I'm not sure if I heard anything, but that's just a buzzer. <laughs> if you want to play some sound off, you detect something. Uh, this is a carbon monoxide. And these, these all, uh, for example, these uh, also have the three pins, the uh, power, ground, and data. So it will work the same way that, um, that um, the, the the, the infrared sensor works. So you're gonna send zero one, and that's gonna that are gonna buzz or stop buzzing. So um, carbon monoxide. How about this one? Guess which one this is. Temperature or light? Uh, kind of pressure is a, a digital touch. If you touch your hand in there, it's gonna throw an event. Um, this is a flame. All right, so I, I don't want to check whether my house is on fire, but it came on a box and that's fine, I have in there. This is a vibration, this temperature and humidity, that, that, that one, I, I do want to poke around that. This one is sound, uh, that's interesting as well, uh, but <coughs> it doesn't seem this one is gonna give you the sound, it's just gonna say, hey, there is some sound level over here and not. This is the coolest one that came in the box uh, and also the biggest. Can you guess which one is this? Water level, exactly. Uh, oh man, I never could guess anybody would find out that this is a water level. Uh, this is a water level. I want to play around with this so much. Uh, uh, and uh, so my home monitor system. So let me go through now my experiment that I did on my house. This is what I actually installed on my house. I deployed this, this that that app into Heroku, and it's going to there running. Uh, and um, I went on a vacation, on a very long vacation. So all my family went on a vacation for two months, uh, sometime November, December last year. And our contractor was, he was gonna come to the house regularly. Uh, a side note on this contractor, he, he's been doing all the renovations that we do in the house for the last four, four, four or five years. And, um, and he was just there going, gonna go to the house, walk through and make sure he's not on fire. Uh, when we are gone, so and I asked him, hey, there will be something stuff, some stuff there in the living room. So every time you come by, you walk around the living room a couple of times as you're doing your chores. But do that for me because uh, I have this thing that uh, probably you're gonna have to install at my house next year, and I want to test it. So and uh, and that's what happened. So we we flew away and uh, November first, and we. Came back and the, the experiment was planned to start November 1st, which is the day that we leave, until 21st, which is the last day that the contractor is supposed to, to go at our house before we come back. <coughs> and I left running. I left this stuff running with that sensor uh, on my living room, connected, the sensor is there. And um, let me show you a little bit of um, the logs of that. So, <laughs> so here we go. It's running localhost, but these are, oh, sorry. Oh, that is gonna be. Okay, that is um, display. There you go. Uh, 
So this is that this is that Rails app that is on uh, is running on my on my Mac, but is a backup database from uh, from what I, I I got reported on Heroku. And during that time, I got six six hundred seventy nine uh, reports of presence in my house, and I was like, whoa. And um, so everything started around there. You see, October 29, um, this is probably some test. The first one, I did one, I did two. So November 1st was the day that I was trying to finish this stuff and get it working. So I had to stay late night and I was testing, you see? 3.30 a.m., this is 3.30 a.m. my time, whatever time zone in US. Uh, 3.45 and the test keep going. You see, th here's where I realized that uh, you see, 340 is when I realized that I need some kind of timer because I don't want to see three, three presents because I just crossed my hand in front of the sensor. That's so all like, all right, maybe five minutes or one minute is the time that if you pass here, it detects presence five times in a minute. I just want to find out that that happened once. So that's what I, I, I did that, um, the two minutes, uh, the one minute. So November 1st, I kept walking, 350. 55, 4 a.m., 4 a.m., and then 4.20, and then I went to sleep, and <laughs> 7 a.m., I don't know, this, I don't know, my wife, my kids, I don't know what happened. Here's us probably going, packing up and going, going on vacation, November 1st, and then November <coughs> 5 p.m., and uh, <clears throat> let me keep going here, so... Sorry, it went too fast. November 1st, 5 p.m. This probably was packing up and going, going and traveling. And then here we left the house, somewhere around this. But I don't know what happened at that night at my house. Uh, <laughs> and it kept going, you see it, 3 a.m. I know the contractor that was going to my house pretty well, uh, and uh, that is extremely unlikely was him. So, um, and, but I have to make a side, another side note in here. Uh, and um, he, the, this guy, uh, and uh, he, he believes in ghosts. He <laughs> believes in ghosts. Once a couple of years ago, and uh, he came back for another for another reno round of renovation of the house, and he said. And we were talking about something like, hey, there's a lot of, I see a lot of noise in your house. I, there's something going on in here, and, and he's scared of that. Uh, so, but anyway, and that happened way before I started working with this pie stuff. He, we had this conversation. And um, so, <coughs> my sensor kept going. Uh, the, my sensor kept going. The infrared motion sensor kept detecting infrared where that is. And this was installed in my living room, uh, near my TV. Uh, it was winter in the US, so the house was, the, 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 the uh, heating system was coming and going as it's too cold and heats up. Uh, so it's possible it's that, I don't know. But there was no direct uh, uh, air going into the sensor. And I had the black tape on the sensor, so I wasn't trying to catch a lot of uh, small things. Uh, I just want to see if this is working. And this kept going. November 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, um, <coughs> at all times of the day, during the day, night, and afternoon. Some of these days are really my contractor here coming to the house and check it up, make sure that everything is fine. Uh, November 8th, and, and then that kept going. So I'm, I'm not going to keep going over here. Uh, but um, if you keep, if you scroll to these, that's gonna keep going. And I was gone, and um, you see, every time in the from two to four, every time between one a.m. and four a.m., there was some event. And even if my contractor went to my house to throw some parties when I'm gone, he didn't do that every day. So um, and uh, and that kept going, kept going. And one day I called him, uh, or he called me. And I told him that this was happening, and, and he told, guess what he told me? Ghost. I told you there is a ghost in your house. <laughs> and around November um, 19, I asked him to shut down. 
Because when I, when I said that this was happening in the house, and he said, no, no, I'm not going there. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and he was, all right, go power off that stuff. Go that, unplug from the power, and that's it. I, I'm done with my sensor, with my, uh, <laughs> my experiment. And um, it was, was planned to, to last until December, but it just took a couple weeks. Uh, now let me, me display off and come back to my presentation. So that also my experiment. And um, so here goes, here are my theories, right? So what happened in my house? Um, so one of the things is there is a ghost in my house. It's, it's possible that, that that's happening. Um, and that ghost is generating some infrared in my sensor and in the, as, soon as, the, as soon as the ghost wakes up and walks through my house, it, it detects pencils and my, sens my sensor is detecting that. Uh, my infrared sensor is detecting that. So the other theory is there is an infrared noise near my sensor, which is, I don't know which one is more likely, but uh, uh, it's a possibility. Um, the other possibility is my sensor is broken. That's another thing, it's hard to test. That's not like pushing your code to GitHub and let your CI run your test. That's not how you test sensors. Uh, and it's, it's hard to find out whether it's broken or not. Uh, but I do suspect this one is broken. Uh, or can be a bug in my code. Uh, I work on the code every night from 10, 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. <coughs> not every night, but I didn't have a lot of time before I travel. And, um, because I wanted these to leave these running on my house at my house when I was gone, I didn't have much time. I had to finish by the time I was I was leaving, and um, so. But the code is pretty straightforward. Most likely the sensor is broken, <coughs> or there's some noise. I don't know, or maybe there is a ghost. Uh, so here are all the references uh, that I that I throughout the the, the code the, the presentation and. Um, that's what I came up here to talk to you guys. So thank you for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. We have 10 minutes for questions. No questions? Yeah, please. Do you have multiple raspberry pies or just cables from the sensor or from the house? Can, can you repeat the beginning of the, the question? Do you have multiple pies or just one with a lot of cables going through the whole house? Okay, so the question is if I have multiple pies uh, or only one pie, multiple pies at the, through the house, right? Uh, no, I only have one. Uh, so far, I only bought one. And, um, and, uh, but my, my idea for my next renovation project at the house is to kind of install maybe two, one at the front door and one at the back door of the house. Um, I'll probably try to do that sometime, summer this year. What are some of the debugging tools that you use with the Raspberry Pi? Like say, um, I don't know, say um, you plug in the SD card and <coughs> like boot up. What are some of the things you do to figure out why that's happening. So the question is, what are the debugging tools that I use to, to troubleshoot the Pi? And um, if, I, if I put the SD in a boot up and it doesn't run, what do I do? So uh, that's a good question. I didn't use any fancy tools. Uh, the problem that I had with that uh, block size 32 megabytes, I Googled the heck out of that to see if I could find anything. I couldn't find nothing explaining why, why it was breaking, why my Pi was not, uh, the Linux wasn't stacking up. For the sensor stuff, uh, that's a simple script, and uh, so there's not a lot of, um, <coughs> I never really came across any tool to test the sensor itself, but it's just logging, and uh, so it didn't really use any, any debugging tool other than trying to find an answer on the internet. Any more question? Um, can you read like, you, you can only read one or zero from, from the sensor, or you can read if it's like too hot or not too hot. Can, uh, I'm not sure if I follow your question. Isn't there a, a way to, to measure if, uh, if there is too hot? How hot is it from the sensor? 
It's only one of the, like true or false. Okay, so the question is uh, if there is a way to measure how hot is the sensor. Uh, so this is infrared, so it just gives you high and low. Okay. But I do believe there are some temperature sensors that can give you, like the, the water level. The water level is going to give you something else other than true or false. It has to give you 10, 20, 30, whatever percentage on that level. So it, that's going to vary by, you know, sensor by sensor. Most likely on a sensor like that, you may need more than three pins. Uh, or maybe it's going to fire everything, I, everything changes, I, I give you a number. So I give you 10, 20, and then in that case, only one pin should be enough. Uh. I believe that uh, changing your approach and using a, a camera instead? So the question is if I, uh, if I, if I look into changing my approach and use a camera to detect. That's that's an interesting question. Uh, the application that does that called motion. Yeah. So instead of, instead of detecting infrared and, and saying oh there is an infrared in here, um, you yeah you keep you keep taking pictures and then you detect movement and you compare you can compare images and see if there's anything. Anything. Uh, the one reason why I would I didn't go for that is because I want to test the sensor itself. The camera is just. A, software and you put a camera in there in your USB and then a bunch of software doing that. The sensor, no, the sensor is a piece of hardware that you have to jump in and you cable in into the Pi and do that. So that's why I, I, I decided to do that. But I do want to uh, extend that to use that other code that detects the presence and light up the camera, record, because if there is a ghost in my house, maybe the camera is going to tell me something. <laughs> Any more questions? I have a question. Did you resolve the case? Uh, no, no, I have not. I have not resolved the case. What about a mouse? It could be a mouse that only gets to my house when we are gone, because I never seen a mouse living there for four, for four years. I never seen a mouse in the house. So, but it could be. Is that maybe a smart mouse? Oh. And it only comes a fly. A fly. A fly. The, the one reason that I put that tape in there is. Um, so the, the infrared sensor has two uh, tuning parameters. One is sensitivity and one is timing. <coughs> I tuned that really down, but uh, to the minimum sensitivity possible, and I put the tape to try to go around that. So if, if a fly goes around, it's not gonna hit the sensor, but it could be. So maybe the camera was gonna help me to find out if there is a fly, a mouse. What do you use that black for? Uh, thank you for, uh, for asking this question. So the question is, why do, what do I use the rec for? And the question is, I still don't know. <laughs> this, is a, this is a freaking cool toy. This is a, this is a Raspberry Pi cluster. Uh, so over here, we have uh, five boards. One board, two, three, four, and five. On top, this is a switch that connects all of them at the net, um, and you can get out to the web. And at the bottom is a 500 gigabytes SD card, and all these pies they have Linux using uh, NFS, so that instead of using the SD card, these 32 gigabytes SD card, they're using Linux NFS on the SD, on the, on the SD drive, on the SSD drive. And um, I got this picture from, um, um, the reference is here. This is a guy from Google that made this presentation in DC a couple of months ago, and he found out this in a conference here in, in, UK, in, in Europe. And you can buy these and you can, you, can, you can do that yourself, but this costs like $600, so it's not that cheap, and um, I'm still trying to find a use for that. So if you guys have any idea, let me know, uh, because I'm really interested in buying one of those, but uh, for that kind of money, I need to find a a better usage other than uh, uh, hunting ghosts. So. Okay, but the Raspberry can boot directly from NFS, uh, or you need this, uh, an SD cloud. So the question is if the Pi can boot directly from the NFS. I don't know. I, uh, that's a good question. But on that link, there is a whole article that the guy did. Uh, he, it's possible that he did something, or it's possible that <coughs> he, uh, yeah, he, he might have a, an SD card in there. I'm not sure if you can boot directly from the NFS, but it's all Linux. I think most, mostly it was with, with, uh, with an SD card because I wasn't able to boot from NFS. 
But have you, have you tried using NFS? I, I, I tried just, uh, uh, just starting it up and it didn't... Uh, okay. Yeah, you may need the SD because you need to get the Linux, something the Linux in there, then the Linux node that needs to go to the NFS. So. Yep. Thank you very much. All right, thank you guys.